everyone and welcome to tonight's Pint of Science event. I'm your host Monia and we are broadcasting live from London. Because of this pandemic, we can't hold this event in one of London's great pubs. So we're bringing it home to you. Hopefully you still enjoy it with a very nice beverage and it would be really great if you could share the drinks you are having or your favourite drinks in the comment section below together with your location. We will get back to you during the break in the middle of the show. You can also post your comments on Twitter with the hashtag Behave21 right here. Today we have two wonderful speakers for you, Mark Freestone and Margarita Malenkini, talking about their research and how it can impact our society, the theme of tonight's event. The aim is really to have a fun discussion like we would have in a real pub and get you guys, the audience, involved as much as possible. So please, please leave lots of questions for the speakers in the comment section at any time, even in the middle of the talks. You're also very welcome to engage with each other there. And with that, we will start with our first speaker, Dr. Mark Freestone. Mark is a reader in mental health in the Centre for Psychiatry at Queen Mary. And alongside his very successful research career, he was also consultant to the first two series of the very famous TV show, Killing Eve, you might have watched that and he just published his fantastic book making a psychopath which you can check out later so please everyone leave lots of comments and questions as soon as they pop into your mind also don't forget to let us know about your drinks and whereabouts we'll put up your comments throughout this evening but now over to you mark enjoy everyone hi monia thank you very much uh, it's lovely to be here <clears throat> Very excited to be at the first virtual Pint of Science. I've done the four of the last five years of Pint of Science, and I've been talking about lots of different things related to mental disorder. And, and what I thought I'd do this year, um, which hopefully you'll all enjoy, is try and bring it all together. So the research I wanted to talk about today is some research that we've been doing over the last seven years now at Queen Mary that looks at what is the underlying link between violence and mental disorder. The title of our theme today is, is Please Behave, which is all very well, but um, asking people to behave, particularly if they struggle to, to be oriented in time and place, is a bit of a big, uh, it, it's, it's a big ask of people. And, and, and one of the things that the Ministry of Justice and the National Health Service have been trying to do is try to implement interventions that make a difference in people's lives that, that can help them desist from violence. And try and particularly to understand how we can help people who have a mental disorder, first of all, to desist from being violent towards other people, but also to try and prevent them becoming victims of violence themselves. Because as I'm going to talk about later in the chat, um, that is a, a, a big issue as well. So the, 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 I suppose the inspiration for this idea came from um, a quote from a former Prime Minister, Tony Blair. And he said when his government was first elected or before his government was first elected, actually, that they were going to be tough on crime and tough on the causes of crime. Sounds great. Yeah, wonderful soundbite. Um, what a great ambition. But nobody's really very clear on what the causes of crime are. And my research has been focused on, well, is, is it possible to say that mental disorder, mental disorders, and by that I could mean anything from severe mental, serious mental disorders such as schizophrenia to personality problems such as uh, antisocial personality disorder or psychopathic disorder, through to minor mental disorders such as depression and anxiety. Is it possible that those can cause crime or criminal behaviour in some ways with, with I think a specific focus on the big things such as violence. So what is the link, what is the causal link between mental disorder and violence? Now the idea that there might be a link I think comes largely from research that we've conducted in prisons in, in the UK, specifically in England and Wales. We all know that our prisons are very overcrowded and, and what overcrowding does particularly in prisons is it highlights problems with uh, the prevalence of mental disorder within the prison population. And the Bradley report, which was a report commissioned by the government in 2009 into the prevalence of mental disorder in prisons, found that up to 80% of people in prisons may have a, a, a diagnosis of mental disorder, which is a pretty staggering proportion. So that means that on, it's more likely than not that someone in prison will have a, a mental disorder of some sort. And we know that that could range from maybe a more common mental disorder such as depression all the way through to uh, a psychotic illness such as uh, schizophrenia that we would classify as a severe mental disorder. 
Worse still, and this is another symptom of overcrowding, one in five offenders received absolutely no help or support for that diagnosis while they were in prison. They received no care whatsoever. So they aren't going to get better. Their conditions are not, situation is not going to improve as a result of them being in prison. And we know that prisons are a difficult environment, so that can have all sorts of triggering and negative effects on people who have maybe a, a predisposition or a, a vulnerability to mental disorder in prison as well. The vast majority of those diagnoses will be personality disorder. Um, but a big problem with that is that, and this might help explain a little bit of the problem with treatment, there isn't an evidence-based treatment for personality disorder. And that includes quite severe conditions like borderline personality disorder, psychopathy, narcissistic personality disorder. So there are big problems with mental disorder in prisons. And those problems get worse when people are discharged from prison. So if somebody is released from prison with a mental disorder or a diagnosis of a mental disorder, they reoffend seriously and they reoffend far more commonly than people without that diagnosis. And, and that figure is actually up to about uh, 67%. So two thirds of people discharged from prison will reoffend within 10 years. A mental disorder is strongly independently associated with a, a reconviction for violent offending. And I use the word associated quite carefully here. I'm not saying it causes that, I'm just saying it's associated. If you look at the chart in the, uh, the slide as well, you can see that different disorders are heavily associated with different types of reoffending and different rates of reoffending too. So it's not just the case that somebody having a mental disorder predisposes them to uh, a particular problem. And actually, the base rate for people with uh, depression, as you can see here, is pretty low. Depression is not really a risk factor in itself. So the type of mental disorder, if we look at the top row here, we can see that people with a diagnosis of delusional disorder or personality disorder are far more likely to reconvict, be reconvicted of a, a violent offence across their uh, lifespan after discharge. So the type of mental disorder is really important and that should maybe clue us into the idea that when we think about a causal connection between mental disorder and violent crime, in the words of Ben Goldacre, I think you'll find it's a bit more complicated than that, right? So what I'm going to do today is, is sort of investigate some of the reasons why it might be so complicated and whether there's anything we can do to try and understand that complexity. So I think a really important point to make here is that there's been something of a revolution in the last five or six years about the way we think about the relationship between factors in our social environment. And it's a move away from prediction predictive models such as statistics into an understanding or attempting to form an understanding of causality. Now a big problem with violence is that around well I'd say virtually all 95% plus of the research into violence uh, of the last 60 years has been focused on prediction. How do we predict who's going to be violent and who isn't? And that's a problem for all sorts of reasons and particularly a problem for me because whenever I write a paper that says this is a causal factor for violence, it doesn't matter how well I evidence that, I'll get a reviewer saying you can't say causal, take that out of the paper. And it's like, well, I do, but I can, I, I, I know what I'm talking about, please, can we, anyway, that's a different matter. But what, what can we do to make prediction better? And Judea Pearl, who's a, um, an American statistician and I think a, a computer scientist, came up with this idea of a ladder of causality. If we think about trying to make a difference to people, whether they have a mental disorder and whatever outcome it may be that we're trying to prevent, we need to understand whether doing a particular thing to them, maybe giving them medication, maybe improving their quality of life, maybe helping them to see a therapist, will actually make a difference to their outcomes in the longer term. So we need to be better than just saying, OK, there's an association between these two things. There's an association between mental disorder and, and violence, which we have been doing for the last 60 years. What we need to do is try and think about, well, what if we made an intervention? What if we did something that would try to make a difference in people's lives? And how would we know that doing that something actually made a difference? And to do that, we need to analyse our data and think conceptually about the relationship between things in a different way. And I'll come to some of the ways that we might do that in a little bit. And ideally, we can build a situation where we can ask counterfactual questions. We can start to ask questions like, well, people with schizophrenia have a particular disposition towards being victimised by other people. What would happen if those people with schizophrenia had not been exposed to violence um, as a child? And then maybe the intervention becomes not about doing something to people who already have a diagnosis, but focusing on trying to prevent people being exposed to violence at a young age. 
So answering questions that aren't necessarily inherent within the data that we're collecting, uh, the counterfactual reasoning, and we can only really be sure that we can we're asking causal questions once we can make counterfactual assertions uh, from the data that we have. Okay, so what have we done so far about causality? How can we start to build this link between mental disorder and violence? Well, for a long time, the, the gold standard of understanding the link between mental disorder and violence was the MacArthur Violence Risk Study. So this was a study conducted in the East and Mideast uh, United States of America between 1997 and 2001 and it was a study of over a thousand patients who'd been discharged from civil psychiatric units in Philadelphia um, at Mont <laughs> Montana, Massachusetts in the United States. I think MO is, is Montana. And they were all followed up for a good period of time, so 10 weeks, and they made triangulated searches for any instances of violence, which means they asked the patients, you know, were you violent? But they also asked their clinicians and they checked the medical records to see if they'd done anything violent during that period of time. And what they found was there were a number of factors that were commonly predictive of violence in that group. Prior violence, so prior arrests, sure, some demographic factors such as being young, being male and being unemployed. And, you know, the, the problem with this is where I guess prediction becomes quite annoying because it's like, well, OK, these people have been previously arrested. They're young and they're male. What are we going to do about that? We can't mandatorily reassign their gender. We can't go back and erase what's happened in the past. From a causal perspective, that information is just kind of noise. It doesn't really tell us anything about the causes of, uh, of, of violence. Perhaps more interestingly, there was this idea that child abuse, as a, uh, when you were younger, having some instances of adverse childhood events, child abuse, uh, neglect, and the frequency of those was really important in predictive of violence. And also the behaviour of your parents, particularly your father, your father, father being absent from the home, your father using drugs were generally predictive of violence. And then we had a bunch of clinical factors as well, antisocial personality disorder and schizophrenia as well as anger control, loss of consciousness and involuntary status so people who didn't want to be there. But what was really interesting here was that when we look at schizophrenia, one of the more severe mental illnesses, it's not the case in this big study that schizophrenia was linked to violence. In fact, it's the opposite. You'll see this little minus sign here. It says schizophrenia is actually negatively linked to violence. It's almost a protective factor. People with a diagnosis of schizophrenia were less likely to be violent, thus completely undermining all the purpose of my talk. And I could just sort of drop my mic and, and walk off at this point. That would be uh, quite dramatic. But I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Because <laughs> we're getting into a really important point here. In the MacArthur Violence Risk Study, all of the patients had been treated and discharged from hospital. So they weren't people who just become schizo schizophrenics, they hadn't just become psychotic. They had some kind of treatment and then been discharged. So when we say it's more complicated than there's a link between these two things, a causal link, you're darn tootin', as my friend John Monaghan would say. You know, there's absolutely a more complicated link than that. Another study that really informed our work was a much bigger piece of, of work done with 30,000 adults in the USA who'd had problems with drugs or uh, alcohol in the past five years. And this was a study by Elbergen and Johnson, uh, also done in, uh, in the North America. And they found that independently, severe mental illness, and that's listed in column A here and also present in these other columns with an A in them, so uh, column A and B, A and B and C, wasn't actually predictive of, of uh, an increased risk of violence. But when you combine mental illness with substance misuse, so that's column A and C here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> when you combine, uh, yeah, yeah, with, uh, with A and B, so that's this column here, it increased the risk. So people with schizophrenia who use drugs were also more likely to commit violence. And when you combined that with a history of previous violence, then the odds became much, much, much higher. So it doesn't seem in the Elbergen and Johnson paper to be the case that mental disorder on its own causes violence. There's something more complex about the relationship between having a mental disorder, how you cope with that disorder, i.e. for example using drugs, and whether you have any previous exposure to or previous practice of violence in your life. Makes sense so far I think, uh, and also consolidates a lot of the learning. But whenever you have a big paper like this, and this is one of the most heavily cited papers in forensic psychology and psychiatry uh, of the last uh, uh, 10, 12 years, somebody's always going to come along and say, well, that's one way of looking at it, but there are others. So although 
Elbergen and Johnson suggested that the link between mental disorder and violence may actually be moderated or changed in some way by substance misuse. So in other words, you need to be using substances in order to be violent. Another research team at the University of South Florida, uh, read, led by Richard, Richard Van Dorn, came along and said, OK, well, first of all, the way that you've conceptualised uh, the link between mental disorder and violence is wrong. Because Elbergen and Johnson looked at lifetime diagnosis of mental disorder and any instances of violent behaviour. So what they didn't do, which you should do if you're trying to establish a causal model, was check to see whether the mental disorder diagnosis preceded the violent incident. And when you did that change, that really important change to make things more causal in the model, they actually found that there was a link between mental disorder and uh, uh, violent offending. And in fact, people with um, a severe mental illness had an elevated risk of violence compared to people without a mental disorder. But what they also found was that link was moderated to a very high degree to whether or not those people had what we call triggering events in their lives. So if they were under a particular degree of stress or difficulties at the time or recently any time in the last year they've been exposed to an adverse event, that radically increased by a factor of about three the likelihood of people with a mental disorder being violent. Of course then when you add back in substance misuse then you get to these columns at the end here. And again, they found, you know, substance misuse and mental disorder were very predictive of violence. But it seemed to be the case that the most important thing in terms of a causal onset of violence in this group of 30,000 people was the presence of an adverse event. So stress seemed to be the thing that pushed people into committing acts of violence rather than just being mentally unwell or using substances in themselves. So if we update the model now, we sort of have this link where, OK, childhood events, yet yeah, they're important because they affect the possibility of onset of mental disorder. And substance misuse also exacerbates the chances of you being violent. But all of this seems to be moderated by whether or not there's a sort of adverse event in the middle of all this. There has to be something that predisposes you to be violent in the moment. And you could think of this in terms of maybe somebody perhaps having problems at work, an argument with their partner, or perhaps somebody ins feels insulted in some way by something something said to them. That would trigger a violent event. So it's really important to think of these sort of static concepts like mental disorder and substance misuse in combination with a particular kind of adverse environment at the, at the point and, and at a specific point of time that pushes people from simply being, you know, it, I suppose, in some risk category into actually being in a position to commit a violent crime. So one other way we thought about trying to break up what this specific link might be, the specific trigger, is to think about, well, are there specific symptoms of mental disorder that might be responsible for controlling this really complex causal link between mental disorder and violence? So my colleagues, Robert Kears, Jeremy Coyd and Simona Ulrich, looked at the MacArthur data. This is the data from the, the first research slide I showed, again, using the, the prevalence approach uh, by Van Dorn and colleagues. And they were able to replicate this finding again and again. And they were looking at the link between delusional symptoms. Delusions are a symptom of delusional disorder, but also uh, psychotic disorders such as uh, schizophrenia. And they found that there was a link between having delusions of being spied upon, what we might call paranoid delusions, and increased risk of violence. But what they did was, was something quite clever. They asked the, the, well, they checked the, the research records to see if the people who were suffering from those delusions reported being angry in response to those delusions using something called the uh, uh, the, the delusions uh, delusion scale, mixed anxiety and delusion scale, the MAD scale, and they found that uh, whether or not people were angry completely moderated. That is, it completely sorry, it's completely mediated. That is, it completely changed the relationship between delusions and violence. People who weren't made angry by their delusions weren't violent. There was no significant link between delusions in themselves and violence unless people were made angry about that. So this complicates the waters quite a lot because it seems to be the case that it's not the mental disorder or the symptoms of mental disorder at all that are driving violence, but rather people being made angry or aroused or upset by some content of their mental disorder. So although it may be the case that symptoms of mental disorder increase people's likelihood of becoming angry, it doesn't necessarily causally mean that they will be violent. It's a more complex link that's about levels of arousal and stress in the body, perhaps even anxiety, which is a different story that maybe I'll tell next year.
So if we update our causal map, suddenly it's starting to look really quite complicated. We have environmental features that may be related to whether some people suffer adverse childhood events in their past. That may increase or decrease their environmental sensitivity to adverse triggers that may then push them into violent crime. Or it may be about genetic factors as well as environmental factors that may increase people's predisposition to mental disorder. So I could go on, but already you're starting to see that the link is getting more and more complex the more and more research evidence we add into this. It's also really important to say that as well as committing violent crime, mental disorder radically predisposes people to becoming victims of violent crime. And a paper from 2003 looking at about 700 civil psychiatric patients, um, they found that the risk of violent victimisation was over three times what it was for people with a mental disorder as opposed to the general population. Another piece of work in 2005 um, said that for a similar sample of patients, so 1,000 patients versus 32,000 in the general population, uh, over 25% of those patients had experienced victimisation, which was 11 times the general population rate. And that didn't change whether you adjusted for people being young, uh, say black, or, or different ethnicity, or not having a job, not being married, all the traditional sort of risk factors for violence. And finally, some work that we did in 2016 looked at a, a survey of 5,000 young men aged between 18 and 30. And we found that exposure to violence radically increased the chances of you being victimised. Yep. So an experience of childhood physical abuse, if you're victimised as a child, somehow that translated into you being three times more likely than those who hadn't been victimised of, of being uh, victimised as an adult. Severe mental illness such as schizophrenia also massively increased the risk of being victimised as an adult. And there was a linear trend between the number of adverse childhood events that you have, so whether it was sexual abuse, uh, uh, physical abuse, neglect, that the more of those you had, the more the likelihood of you being victimised increases. So how can we put all this together? Well, it's a bit of a wordy slide, but basically I'm saying... It's not really meaningful to say that mental disorder causes violence because it's just one of a huge complex web of psychosocial factors. You might as well say, for example, that mental disorder causes you to be a victim of violence. In fact, that there's some evidence that might even be a more true assertion. And this web is likely to be individualised for the person. So it will depend on your genetic risk, your childhood experiences, your previous exposure to violence, either as, either as a perpetrator or a victim, and your sort of environmental resilience. But because these are all correlated, it's very difficult to sort out what we should focus on. And that hampers our ability to get into what's really important, the interventions that we do to prevent violence and victimisation. So as I said, with the causal approach, we need to move away from these predictive regression models and move into a much more causally based focus with a lifetime emphasis. Now, one way of doing this is to look at uh, an approach that uses um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And this is the approach we're working on at the moment. Um, this is a, from a paper in 2015 looking at risk factors for violence among discharged prisoners. Uh, this uses an approach called uh, Bayesian network analysis. So within this network, you'll see there's lots, you probably can't see them, but take my word for it. <laughs> it's too complicated, that's the problem. There's lots of nodes relating to factors in people's lives, social isolation, previous victimization, genetic predisposition to risk, treatment, um, emotional affect, aggression, psychopathy, narcissistic personality disorder. And all of these within this model are individualized by patient so what I can do is say well this patient has these particular risk factors what do I need to change in order to reduce their risk of violence so if I was a probation officer I may well be able to do that and find that for this particular person alcohol uh, abuse treatment and maybe psychotic med antipsychotic medication were most important for them whereas for somebody else it might be uh, psychological treatments it might be treatment for anxiety it might be um something relating to reducing their levels of drug use. So we can actually individualise, which I think is a really important causal step, the recommendations for treatment that we're making for an individual patient. So I've made it all very complicated for you and I can only apologise for that, but maybe that's the reality. So thank you very much for listening. Um, this talk is, is dedicated to one of my former colleagues, Dr Rob Kears, uh, who sadly uh, left us last year, uh, but was hugely influential on my thinking and it, it was involved in writing a number of the papers that I've cited. Uh, and also some of this work was funded by the National Institute for Health Research under a, a grant improving um, a risk assessment in uh, mental health services in the UK. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, my Twitter link is already there, um, but I'm, I'm sure that my colleagues at Pine Science are going to uh, share it as well. So thank you very much and back to you, Matya.
Thank you, Mark, for this really interesting presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. For everyone in the audience, you can still leave your questions now if you haven't done so already. Also, don't forget to tell us about your drinks. Um, but back to you, Mark, now, and I receive the questions. And um, we have the first one coming through from Julia. Julia's asking, is there a bias regarding mental disorders and violence when looking at prisons? For example, are people with mental disorders more likely convicted by a jury or less able to defend themselves? So that's a really good question, Julia. And it, it, the answer to that varies from country to country. So in the United Kingdom, I think, fortunately, we have a forensic mental health system. And that means that when somebody with a severe mental illness comes to court, they can be a judge by the court to be either not fit to represent them to, to make a plea to not fit to plead not guilty or guilty or they can be judged by the court to be not guilty by reason of insanity and those people wouldn't go into prison they would go into the forensic mental health system so they go to a, a psychiatric hospital specialized psychiatric hospital and there's about uh, 50 of these spread across england and wales and a few more in scotland so hopefully nobody with that sort of problem would would come to court and be sent directly to prison they'd be identified and taken out of the system the people in prison tend to be either people who have a long-standing personality disorder so a problem that's been around since uh, they were very young or they have a, 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 a mental disorder that develops within prison so something like prison psychosis or you know depression the prisons are depressing places i worked in one for three years it depressed me at times i'll be honest with you so that kind of environment is not good for your mental health and it can cause you to have all kinds of problems that emerge only when you're sent to prison and even then some of those people can be transferred out but that's where we have the problem that was illustrated in that slide that there's not enough places for us to transfer everyone in prison who has a mental disorder into a psychiatric facility it's very expensive we just don't have the resources for it unfortunately yeah thank you mark uh, next question is from andrina uh, you mentioned one in five might not get help at prison, but the statistics might involve those with help and without any idea of how to plug those gaps or ensure more effective treatment regarding reoffending. Yeah, that's a really good observation, uh, Andrina. Um, <laughs> so a fifth won't get any help at all, but far more than that will get inappropriate help. Um, that can mean, you know, that, that prisons have a tendency. So if somebody runs a drug rehabilitation program, there's 20 people on the wing and only three of them have drug problems, but there's five places on the course. They'll just rope two people in to make up the numbers. And we have a lot of evidence that suggests that that approach, and this was uh, um, this resulted in quite a, a scandal about uh, three years ago where a report was commissioned into the sex offender treatment program uh, and found that this treatment for sex offending that had been the gold standard in the UK for probably about 30 years was actually ineffective and one of the reasons it was ineffective because about a third of the people on sex offender treatment programs were not suitable for those programs so we have a huge mismatch between the, the vast array, array of needs of people in prisons which could as i said vary from you know anxiety to depression to serious mental illness to uh, simply offending related problems or personality disorder and a very simple simplistic range of psychological and psychiatric interventions to offer them so it's a huge problem um, that i've only been able to scratch the surface of and that's a talk for another time maybe thank you yeah. well i guess there's certainly room for improvement <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> um next question from jenny and uh, she's asking so if i follow this people experiencing mental health issues might be victims of violence but those being violent and also be more likely to have mental disorders are people who are violent more likely to have mental disorders um that's a a much more complex question than you might imagine because it, it depends how you measure it so a lot of research that was done in the 1990s, for example, looked at big population level surveys, which were taken from the, the, uh, the Scandinavian countries have a, a, a linked database of health and criminal justice statistics. So you can look at that within those uh, populations about who has had a mental disorder and who's gone to prison. And if you do that kind of analysis, you get very, very significant uh, associations between let's take schizophrenia because I've been talking about it and violence but that doesn't allow for any nuances about whether that person received treatment whether the illness was active whether they were actually experiencing symptoms at the time they were violent so if somebody and this has happened to some of my patients somebody could commit a violent crime go to prison and become psychotic uh, 
they would have been flagged up by that kind of research as being somebody whose disorder, mental disorder was linked to violence. But that's totally inappropriate because people can be very traumatised by the violence that they commit. So that person certainly shouldn't have been included in that research. And that's why these nuanced moves towards an understanding of causality are so important. Because if we're going to establish that link, we need to have the information that says this person was unwell at the time they committed this offence. And when we look at that information, the link is far more subtle. As I said with the Elbergen, the, sorry, the Van Dorn paper, again, just having a severe mental illness isn't really an appreciable increase in your risk of being violent. It's when you, when you add in these other psychosocial factors, such as adverse childhood events and um, whether somebody's under a lot of stress and whether they're using drugs, that then creates the risk. So it's a, it's a multiplicative effect rather than a simple association. And I think that any paper that just says there's a link between severe mental disorder and people being more likely to be violent is probably wrong because that's so um, so it lacks enough nuance as to be misconstrued as saying that if you go and work in a, 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 a mental health outpatient clinic, you're exposing you to some, yourself to some kind of violence risk, which is not true at all to say the least. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, causality is always difficult to, to prove and to assess, I guess. Great but question. That really that... prompted me to, to, to explain <laughs> that well. Well, huh? that's what we're here for. I think there's one more question, a last question. Yes. Jellyfish, uh, nice name, is asking, considering those being angry, being likely to commit violence, do you think of falling in our ability to handle cases of those with mental health is where we for fail to help prevent offending or reoffending. Yeah, yeah, that's an absolutely accurate observation. Um, there's a, a really an old an oldie but a goodie. The Penrose hypothesis, which was a, a psychiatrist called Roger Penrose, writing in the 1950s, said that if you increase the number of psychiatric beds in a country, it will exponentially decrease the number of prison beds you need. In other words, if you offer people help for their mental health, it will reduce the number of prisoners. And that's been tested in many, many different countries now. Most recently, 2016, one of my colleagues, Adrian Munt, did a study in Chile, Peru uh, and Uruguay. And he found that, that even though this 50 years ago that the hypothesis was put forward, it's still true. If you build more hospitals, you can knock down some prisons. Um, it's really as simple as that. So we are failing at a pretty fundamental level to help identify and prevent violence by intervening early enough in people's lives to take them out of violent situations to educate them how to i suppose be more resilient uh, in terms of their uh, their experiences of the, the, the environment around them um, and to help them give them coping skills and, and interventions that will stop them then from developing more severe mental illnesses and also potentially become involved with violence as well so a lot of a lot of things we need to change. That's just an iceberg that I can only chip away at my answer here, but it's a really good observation. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I mean, I guess prevention is always better. I mean, if you can prevent violent crimes, <laughs> great. If that's the takeaway message, I'm yeah. delighted. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Um, well, thank you everyone for this good discussion, for your questions. And of course you, Mark, thank you so much. We'll see you again at the end. Um, now we have a small interval where we get back to your drinks to get a little bit more up and pop atmosphere going here. I'm not so sure about my favorite drink, but I am having an orange juice in this gigantic beer glass, a little bit puppy. Um, but what about you and the audience? So Lorena uh, from San Diego, hello. Uh, she's having a tea. Oh, great, very British, not very pop like, but liking it, liking it. And we have more. Tina is having a Samuel Blanc, my favorite white wine as well. So very good choice. Um, do we have one more? Uh, Yuji is having a water. Sensible, sensible in Birmingham. Thanks for sharing. Um, we'll just leave these comments coming through. But we also have um, a small quiz for you, a quick quiz about booze. Um, so let me know your yes or no answers in the comment section below and I'll tell you the answer. Just very quick, three questions. So the first one is, is mixing spirits with diet versions of fizzy drinks better? Maybe the rationale is to save some calories here? What do you guys think? Yes or no? Hmm. Well, the answer is actually, if you have some time to think, no. Um, well, I guess it depends on how much you actually want to get drunk because mixing spirits with, for example, Diet Coke gets you 18% more drunk than the full fat variety. 
And the theory is that full sugar drinks are recognized as food by your body, which slows down alcohol absorption, whereas diet drinks are not. So you can bear that in mind for the next time you might enjoy such a drink. Great, so moving on to the second question. Um, does the color of your drink affect how much you would pay for it? So I give you the question is a little bit ambiguous, but I can tell you the answer concerns beer. So think about the color of different beers and how that might affect you. What do you think? Yes or no? Um, yes, yeah, so the answer is yes, it actually does. Research suggests that consumers expect dark beers to be more expensive than pale or amber beers. Personally, I don't like either, so I couldn't tell you how accurate this is, um, but you can let me know in the comment section below. And then we have a final and third question. Is Britain the booziest place in the world? Hmm? What do you guys think? Again, just from the wording of the question, the answer is probably going to be no, um, but what other country might it be? Maybe you can type that along with your answer in the comment section. Yes or no? The answer is, as expected, no. According to a World Health Organization study, that honor actually goes to South Korea. They apparently drink more hard spirits than anywhere else in the world which did surprise me. Let me know whether it surprises you as well. I would have had some other countries on top of the list. Um, but yeah, great. Thank you, everyone. This was our small and short break. I know that we're all a bit refreshed. We will move on to our second speaker of the evening, Dr. Margarita Malankini. Margarita is a lecturer in psychology at Queen Mary, and she's a first time participant in Pint of Science. And she researches the complicated question as to why um, some people in our society do better at school than others. And as part of this, Margarita is the founder and director of MILES, which is a great and ongoing research project with over 2,000 Italian secondary school students. Again, I would ask you, the audience, please to leave lots of comments and questions. And now we move over to Margarita. There you are. Hello. Hi. Enjoy, everyone. Can you all see my screen? We can see you. Yes, we can see your screen. It's just not in presentation mode yet. Perfect. No. Wonderful. Thank you. So, yes, thank you so much for inviting me. This is my first pint of science, and I'm really excited to talk to you about educational success and specifically what matters for educational success beyond intelligence and why. So several factors contribute to explaining why students differ from each other in, ac in academic achievement. And <clears throat> these factors include the home, the school, the neighborhood environment, the prenatal environment they're exposed to, their healthy physical development, motivations, intelligence, for example. However, one source of differences between students that is very rarely considered in models of education is genetics. And today, I will present evidence for how genetic differences between people contribute to their observed differences in learning. So even when genetic factors are taken into account, which is rarely, it is often assumed that genetic factors would contribute to academic achievement through cognitive ability, which is also called intelligence, and which at its core is the ability to plan, reason, and think abstractly. So it is often assumed that academic achievement is partly heritable, because cognitive ability is heritable. But here, I will present evidence for the contribution of genetic factors to academic achievement beyond intelligence. And I really will start to identify which are those factors that contribute to ge the genetics of academic achievement beyond intelligence. And finally, I will discuss how we can start thinking about a comprehensive evidence-based model of education that integrates these genetic discoveries. So, Evidence for how genetic differences between people contribute to their differences in behavior and psychological traits first emerged from family studies and specifically twin studies. So twin research capitalizes on the genetic relatedness between identical twins who share 100% of their genes and fraternal twins who share on average 50% of the genes that differ between individuals like any other pair of siblings. And by comparing how similar identical and fraternal twins are for a trait, it is possible to calculate the extent to which differences between people in that trait are due to genetic and environmental factors. 
And twin studies allow to identify three key influences. Genetics, or A, uh, called in our complicated ACE models, shared environmental influences, or C, which are the environmental factors that make children growing up in the same family more similar to one another, for example, shared parenting, and non-shared environmental factors, or E, which are the environmental factors that don't contribute to similarity between siblings, such as, for example, different peer groups or different friendships. So how heritable is academic achievement? And what I mean by that is, to what extent do genetic differences between students contribute to their observed differences in academic achievement. In this twin study, conducted in a very large sample of twins from England and Wales, we found that academic achievement is substantially heritable, about 60%, at every stage of compulsory education, from age 7, so key stage 1, to age 16, measured at GCSE, as it's indicated by the red portion of these bars. Interestingly, in this study, we also found that academic achievement is highly stable over development. And we found that on average, 80% of disability was explained by genetic factors. But this is not all that we found. Once we statistically removed intelligence from the equation, we found that academic achievement remains substantially heritable, stable, and its stability mostly accounted for by genetic factors which indicates that a substantial portion of differences between students in academic achievement and in its heritability is not explained by intelligence. And this is really not a new idea. And as the, in fact, as the Soyeski famously wrote in Crime and Punishment, it takes something more than intelligence to act intelligently. However, what is this something more that makes us act intelligently? And we explored this question in this study conducted in another twin sample of children from Austin, Texas. And we focused on answering one key question, which is what matters for academic achievement beyond cognitive ability and why? And here we'll present results focusing on reading ability. So this bar chart shows the proportion of reading ability that is accounted for by genetic, or A, shared environmental, or C, and non-shared environmental factors, or E. And if we focus on the bar on the left, which indicates the extent of the genetic contribution to reading ability in childhood, first of all, we see the genetic factors explain about 75% of the differences between children in reading ability. So reading is substantially heritable. But so now let's focus on the red, purple, and blue portions of the bar. And these uh, indicate about that about 55% of these differences are explained by different types of cognitive ability, for example, fluid intelligence or executive functions. But in light blue, the light blue and the green portions of the bar show how much of other factors contribute to the genetics of reading ability after statistically removing the role of intelligence. And these are personality and motivational factors, which are also called non-cognitive skills. And non-cognitive is really an imperfect term to describe those skills that differ from what has traditionally been education's primary focus, so academic and cognitive performance. And the umbrella of non-cognitive skills includes a very wide range of competencies, such as academic motivation, perseverance, mindset, learning strategies, and social skills. And here, we examined the role played by many non-cognitive skills. And we found that non-cognitive skills that we found that non-cognitive skills related to how open to experiences students are, for example, how interested, curious, confident, and, and creative students are, all matter for reading ability beyond intelligence. And in fact, these skills mattered more than diligence, perseverance, and conscientiousness, for example. And the fundamental part of this work was to explore why these non-cognitive skills were associated with reading ability. So do they relate to reading ability, largely for genetic or environmental reasons? And we found strong genetic links between non-cognitive skills and academic achievement beyond intelligence. Therefore, non-cognitive skills, such as interest, curiosity, self-confidence in learning, all matter for academic achievement beyond intelligence, and partly because there is a shared genetic predisposition towards both academic achievement and non-cognitive. 
However, twin studies don't really allow us to identify the specific molecular basis and to identify where in the DNA this genetic predisposition lies. And in order to uh, identify specific genes, we need to conduct gene discovery studies called genome-wide association studies, or GWAS. And GWAS aim to uncover how differences between individuals at several places in the DNA relate to differences in their traits from height, for example, to personality, to cognitive ability. And these places in the DNA are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. And one of the largest and most successful gene discovery studies in the behavioral sciences looked at educational attainment and uncovered over 1,200 places in the DNA, called SNPs, that are significantly associated with how far people go in education. And, uh, all the SNPs uncovered by the study are shown here in this figure, um, in the figure shown here on the right, which shows the chromosomes on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis, how significant each association is. And all the dots above the black dotted line are the loci, so the places in the DNA that are associated with variation in, edu in educational attainment after accounting for hundreds of thousands of tests. So the take-home message here is that there is not one or a few genetic variants associated with how far people go in education, but it is many genes, so each of very small effect. So given our previous findings on how genetic differences between people matter for non-cognitive skills uh, and for how these relate to academic achievement, we really wanted to conduct gene dis a gene discovery study and pinpoint the genetic variants associated with differences between individuals in non-cognitive skills. However, we were faced with a number of challenges, and the core challenge being that data on non-cognitive skills, unfortunately, are not often collected as part of large biobanks. But ultimately, we realized that a way of overcoming these challenges started with the definition of non-cognitive skills themselves. So if we were willing to embrace a popular, yet imperfect, definition of non-cognitive skills as all the contributions to educational attainment that are not cognitive skills, then we could find a way around the challenges and we could leverage information from existing gene discovery studies to obtain a GWAS of non-cognitive skills. And so we took two existing powerful gene discovery studies, the one of educational attainment, which I described before, and the gene discovery study of, of cognitive performance to derive a GWAS of non-cognitive skill. So specifically, what we did was to subtract the genetic variants associated with cognitive performance, shown here in blue, from the genetic variants associated with educational attainment to identify genetic variants associated with education beyond cognitive ability, so associated with non-cognitive skills. And we call this method the GWAS by subtraction. So thanks to the GWAS by subtraction, we can finally pinpoint several loci in the DNA. Here we identified 157, but really this is like to be just the tip of the iceberg. But so 157 places in the DNA associated with differences between people in non-cognitive skills are related to education. However, as we saw before, these are many, many genetic variants of very small effect. So each of these individually, it's unlikely to help us identify how these genetic differences in non-cognitive skills relate to differences in behavior. However, an exciting application is that we can now take findings from gene discovery studies and aggregate information from many SNPs, so many places in the DNA across, so across the genome, into a single composite index called the polygenic score. And a polygenic score can be calculated in relatively small samples and provides an index, although partial, of genetic influence on specific traits, in this case, non-cognitive skills. And we constructed polygenic scores for cognitive and non-cognitive skills and examined how each of these polygenic scores predicted differences between people in education-related traits. So if we focus on um, the box, the red box here, you can see the prediction of adult educational attainment. And as you can see, the two curves, the blue and the orange curve, completely overlap, which indicates that the genetics of cognitive and non-cognitive skills are equally important in predicting how far 
people go in education. So, but so we also wanted to see to what extent the genetics of non-cognitive skills contributed to academic achievement beyond the genetic of cognitive, of cognitive skills at every stage in that. And here you can see the extent of the contribution indicated by the orange dots and the contribution of cognitive genetics indicated by the blue dot. And as you can see, non-cognitive genetics contribute substantially to variation in achievement at all developmental stages. But not only that. Here we can see that while the role of cognitive genetics remains fairly stable, the role of non-cognitive genetics increases over time. And this is a finding that has been um, found in several other studies, which have found that polygenic prediction of academic achievement increases over development. But here we can start to provide a preliminary evidence to why that seems to be driving, what, what seems to be driving this increase not cognitive ability, but in fact, non-cognitive skills. This, however, might be counterintuitive. So we know that DNA does not change at birth, but genetic prediction increases over development. How can this be? So evidence of increased irritability and genetic prediction over development are consistent with the existence of gene environment correlation processes, which is really that exposure to the environment does not happen at random, but is in part correlated with genetic disposition. And as children grow up and they are more and more able and inclined to shape their environmental experiences, they do so based in part on their genetic propensities. And this is likely to result in increased polygenic prediction of a development. And here we provide a potential explanation of how this shaping environmental experience related to education based on genetic propensity might happen. So, this seems to be happening through non-cognitive motivational and affective processes rather than solely cognitive ones. So research overall points to the great benefits that come from considering both cognitive and non-cognitive skills in conjunction in order to predict life outcomes such as educational and professional success. However, in addition, of course, to being partly rooted in genetic variation, DS associations are also shaped by the social context and uh, the environment, of course, and by a complex interplay between genes and environment. So students are likely to actively seek out and receive enriched environments, partly based on genetic influences. And I think that our educational system and practice should be more sensitive to this complex interplay between genetic and environmental factors. So to answer the burning question for tonight, what matters for educational success and why? So we now have ample evidence to show that academic achievement is substantially heritable and stable beyond intelligence, and that non-cognitive skills such as openness to new experiences, curiosity, confidence in one's learning, creativity, all matter, and in part they do so via genetic mechanisms. So we can now pinpoint many loci in the DNA that are associated with differences between people in non-cognitive skills, each of very small effects. And non-cognitive genet genetics matter for achievement throughout compulsory education, and really their role becomes increasingly important over development, which likely reflects the complex interplay and the complex correlation between genes and environmental influences. And the genetic discoveries are really a first step to provide a, a platform to investigate biological and environmental mechanisms. So I would argue that it is time to integrate non-cognitive skills in educational practice, shifting the focus away from the current solely performance-oriented culture towards a broader holistic conceptualization of children and adolescents as learners. And I would also argue that a successful integration of non-cognitive skills in, into educational practice would consider both genetic and environmental factors and the complex interplay. And with this, of course, I have many uh, people to thank, particularly my wonderful mentors and all my collaborators, co-authors and colleagues and students. And of course, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Margarita. Um, and this is the last chance for you guys in the audience to leave some comments so, or questions, so please do so. Uh, but Margarita, thank you. That was such a great talk. There's so many different aspects of shaping academic success. 
it seems always just reduced to the IQ. So thank you for highlighting some of the other aspects as well. Actually, I have one very quick question. So obviously, academic success is somewhat related to, I guess, success overall in the workplace. Um, is there are there similar connections, or um, is this beyond your area? <laughs> no, no. Yes, 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 yes. They are. So and and in fact. Uh, Non-cognitive skills are a very good predictor of professional success as well as uh, academic success. And of course, academic success is related to professional success. So, you know, how well you do in school is a very good indicator of how well you might do professionally. And we know that how well you do in school is not really shaped by only by your cognitive ability, but also by all of these personality motivation related characteristics which unfortunately are mostly overlooked by our educational system. So we, our education increases our cognitive ability, but we don't really focus very much on the non-cognitive side of learning, which I think uh, potentially should be more integrated in our educational system. Yeah, certainly sounds like it. We should definitely do that. Uh, but now some questions from the audience. So Andrina is asking, um, or what about the inclusion of emotional intelligence, sometimes seen as opposing skill to standard intelligence? Yes, so absolutely. So, and, and this is really why non-cognitive skills is a very imperfect term. So it seems uh, uh, like a casual uh, phrase, but it really is a big umbrella term that includes several, um, several skills. And one of these is uh, social skills. I, I think it's closely related to emotional intelligence, but absolutely. I think that that's incredibly important to, um, to highlight and, and, and it would be incredibly important to really start thinking about how we can integrate this in the curriculum, so how we can teach these skills as well as teaching all the cognitive and, and academically and knowledge oriented uh, skills. Yeah, true, true. Uh, next question from Loic. Does it mean that mutations could affect our cognitive or non-cognitive skills? If you mean genetic, by mutation you mean genetic variation, absolutely. And that's what exactly uh, what I showed you. So in, uh, in, the, in, in the orange uh, plot, it's called the Manhattan plot. So those are all the places in the DNA that we identify where differences between people relate to their differences in non-cognitive skills. So yes, genetic differences, so if by mutation you mean differences, absolutely, genetic differences between people uh, affect how uh, different we are in our expression of non-cognitive skills, of course, partly, only partly, and of course, uh, the, the main uh, message is also that our genes don't really work in a vacuum, so they always operate within an environment. So particularly for a trait like education, uh, that is completely environmentally contingent. So if we are not taught how to read, we won't show any reading ability, although we might have a good genetic predisposition for it. Yeah. So, Thank you. Uh, next question from Julia. Do you see any differences when twins are the same sex or the opposite sex? Oh, that for uh, that I got the twins. So in terms of uh, correlation, the opposite sex twins seem to be less similar to each other in terms of uh, performance than the same sex uh, twins. However, you know, if you if you consider sex differences, for example, we know that uh, in cognitive ability and particularly the nonverbal aspect of cognitive ability, there is um, there are some sex differences, particularly in spatial ability. Although these are not huge at all, but in uh, at the level of academic achievement, we don't really find uh, many significant sex differences. The uh, performance is equal for males and females at the level of the distribution. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Um, I think we have a last question from Claire. So should we be addressing fear of failure from early childhood? Absolutely, yes. And in <laughs> fact, uh, some of, uh, I did my PhD on uh, academic anxiety, and <laughs> I would say absolutely yes. And, and, we, and we know now that, for example, even the, the way anxiety affects performance, um, is partly based on this uh, non-cognitive skills, partly based on motivation. So in a, in a 
paper that we published a couple of years ago with some colleagues in the mild sample, so the Italian sample of uh, children, we found that uh, academic anxiety, uh, mathematics anxiety specifically, tends to be negatively related uh, with mathematics performance. However, this relationship varies at different levels of motivation. So the relationship between anxiety and performance is negative when children are not motivated. But when children are highly motivated, the relationship between anxiety and achievement actually is positive. And these children are, and, and this seems to be happening through how much time these more anxious children spend in learning mathematics. So absolutely, we really should be addressing fear of failure from early on, and particularly in this highly test-oriented culture that seems to be taking, taking away a bit the joy of learning from the classroom and uh, quite like I, I mean making seems to be making children quite fearful of the outcome more than joyful about learning so I think that you know tests are incredibly helpful but potentially too high stake in this country yeah and um, I have one quick question for that so do you think like approaches like Montessori for example are far better for uh, academic success or just you know learning these these other skills uh, actually uh you know for every parent uh, chooses uh the best for their children right and so i think that uh you know uh, it's uh, a lot of parents do choose this you know to follow a one or another approach however i don't think that there is much evidence to support that the montessori approach actually leads to uh greater um uh, benefit uh, than any other uh, approach. So there isn't actually much evidence. But, uh, you know, it's it, education and, 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 and it's not all about outcome. It's also about the journey. It's about how you feel uh, while learning. And, and if that's the, the right uh, process towards which uh, you enjoy learning, absolutely great although there isn't plenty of evidence to, to show that that leads to a, a greater performance. But as I said, performance is only one indicator uh, of an educational experience. For sure. Thank you, Margarita, uh, for your talk and obviously facilitating this discussion. And with Thank that, you, Mar. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, and with that, our Pint of Science Nights draws to an end. Again, I would like to thank and applause our fantastic speakers. I don't know whether Mark is going to come. Yeah, there you are. Thank you, Mark and Margarita. Um, but obviously also everyone else involved, the entire team, and you, the audience, for taking part and asking questions. Uh, there might still be some unanswered questions, and I'm really sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, but kindly, the speakers have agreed to answer any questions that you might still have on their Twitter accounts, which is below here. Um, so please just post or repost your question there and you'll get an answer. And um, I've just seen some numbers. We had around 80 viewers today, which is absolutely amazing. I hope everyone enjoyed this night and maybe learned a thing or two that you didn't know already. Um, there's a feedback form created uh, by Pint of Science down below in the description. When you fill that out, you also enter a price draw. So maybe you'll actually get something out of this uh, more than just knowledge. Um, but with that, uh, goodbye, everyone. Have a really nice evening. Maybe see you again next year, hopefully in a real pub. All the best from the entire QML Point of Science team. And yeah, cheers. <laughs>